praise the Lord everyone it's great to join you this evening for this Bible study and I appreciate uh, my wife and Brianna and Braden and Janelle being here to sing as they have each week I guess prior to this Adina has joined them but she's uh, returned to St. John for her clinical period and I'm just glad we're able to gather together again tonight uh, to look at the Word of the Lord I, I do want to just reference here, Braden, uh, uh, mention that we will be returning to uh, the sanctuary this sun, Sunday coming, and uh, I, I foresee that we will be doing that on Wednesday nights as well from this point forward, so this will probably be the final Wednesday night that we'll be in this setting and uh, doing this broadcast in terms of Bible study. But Sunday, as he referenced, we are going to be having uh, two services in order to accommodate the restrictions uh, in terms of crowd size that uh, the government is asking us to work with. And so at 10 o'clock and then again at 1130, obviously we'll keep those services, or at least at 10 o'clock, one um, brief uh, or probably will conclude around 11 <laughs> not that we'll um, not that we'll have those that come in at 1130 indoor uh, a great longer service but um, in regards to in regards to making that work as I referenced in the post on Facebook uh, earlier this week we will uh, be asking you to sign up to indicate which of those two services you would like to come to. And so there will be a couple of Facebook posts that we'll put on either tonight or tomorrow morning uh, asking that you sign up or indicate one Facebook post will uh, just ask you to leave your name in the comments if you're wanting to come to the service at 10 o'clock. Uh, the second post on Facebook will ask you to leave your name in the comments if you're wanting to come to the service at 1130. And of course, as my uh, post on Facebook earlier in the week indicated, we will be taking uh, measures uh, throughout uh, the course of that morning to ensure that everyone is as safe as possible uh, if they come uh, to the house of the Lord. Uh, again, I want to say that we understand if there's someone who, by reason of feeling that they have a compromised immune system or they're just uncomfortable, if they can't uh, see themselves coming to either of those services, we understand. But we do want to make, of course, this um, option available for those that are anxious to get back into the house of the Lord. And so keep that in mind as we move forward and we'll look forward to that. Uh, going to uh, uh, going to uh, turn to the word of the Lord in Matthew chapter number six again this evening, and and uh, we have talked about the Sermon on the Mount uh, a few weeks back, and uh, we're going to begin there tonight again, and we'll uh, we'll continue on with our stewardship series, and want uh, to just take a bit of time to talk about uh, how that money impacts our life and particularly what happens or what should happen in the kingdom of God with regards to our money and our giving. I want to uh, say how much we commend everyone. Um, I have been uh, heartened and uh, just think it's a wonderful testimony to the faithfulness of God's people in terms of people's commitment and faithfulness to the house of God, even in a unique time such as this. <laughs> Let's uh, be mindful that we're in unprecedented, unprecedented times, <laughs> sorry, and uh, we've never been down this road before. A prolonged period where we've not actually been able to frequent the house of God and uh, still, when I inquire of Darlene, as sometimes I do, uh, you know, how is the bank account? Because, of course, money is a, a factor and a concern whenever we operate an entity such as this. 
Uh, you know, I, I've been reminded uh, in terms of what she has to say that things have continued to do uh, reasonably well, and we're thanking God for that, and uh, can't say enough about how much we appreciate the faithfulness of God's people and their commitment to the kingdom of God and being faithful in every regard, even when life brings disruptions. And certainly our life has been disrupted, and I'm not speaking about my family alone, I'm speaking about all of us. Our lives have been disrupted over these last, uh, well, I guess almost two and a half months now, uh, since the middle of March. And here we are at the almost the end of May, and we are, we're of course pleased to see things returning to some set or sort of normalcy uh, for for us here, in, at least in the context of church and so on. But Matthew chapter number six and verses number nineteen and twenty, where Jesus makes a compelling statement when he says. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither no moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Thank God for that. And we are uh, wanting to, of course, talk about the topic of stewardship again this evening this may be our final lesson in this series that we'll look at in terms of uh, considering the topic and we are uh, we're wanting to talk about some practical scenarios in terms of the uh, subjects that that God's Word brings up and brings to our attention Job in the scriptures had a great attitude in regards to possessions it seems uh, so unique to us in terms of his facing the disruption that he did, uh, the calamity, trauma that he did in terms of having received all the messages that he received on that fateful day when they began to come and say, uh, this part of your wealth has been wiped out and uh, you've got no more herds or flocks of sheep and goats and no more flocks of or herds of cattle part of me and on and on it went and, and of course it even did touch his family etc but he uh, had a unique response to all of that when he the bible tells us that he uh, exclaimed naked came i out of my mother's womb and naked shall i return the lord gave and the lord hath taken away blessed be the name of the lord uh, he had been brought to this unique scenario unexpectedly and in the face of his trauma in terms of being shocked and dealing with so much loss, he brings us to, uh, to appreciate or to reflect upon his possessions that perhaps to that point had been a part of what you know, made him the man he was. Uh, no doubt he was considered to be wealthy and, and uh, considered to be a man of, of uh, some renown. And, and it seems from the account in chapter one of his book or the book that is written about his life that uh, surely in his having accumulated all that he had that uh, there would have been some prestige or some uh, uh, recognition that he had been uh, he had been blessed and, and uh, been able to accumulate a great amount of, of wealth, etc. And then all of a sudden it is gone. And yet despite the fact that it is gone, he has this backdrop in his life where regardless of the circumstance or regardless of what possessions I have or do not have, God is still uh, worthy of my praise. And God is still worthy to receive of my lips the words, Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's quite a testimony and one that we should all want to uh, duplicate in our own lives. And of course, we, we don't uh, wish upon ourselves or wish upon anyone else 
the same fate that Job met in terms of losing everything he had. And, and, uh, but yet there's these profound moments in that book that is written that give us a glimpse into his innermost man and how he reflected upon God and upon the things that God had put into his life. And of course, the end of the book bears great relevance in terms of how God blessed him again and how God brought him through the trial uh, to realize great uh, blessing uh, and uh, even more than what he had originally had. The Apostle Paul, on the other hand, when we read in 1 Timothy chapter number 6, verses 7 to 8, he said, We brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. What powerful words. And contentment is such a, a very uh, important part of who we are as Christians in terms of recognizing what God has done in our life and bringing us to this place where we're uh, the... Um, uh, the sons and daughters of God and in his kingdom bear a special relevance in terms of his taking care of his own and having uh, his eye upon us in terms of wanting to provide for our needs, etc. But Paul brings us to this matter of contentment. And um, I recall, and I probably have referenced this in the past, that my wife at times has been deliberate about uh, wanting to put the Word of God and keep it as a mainstay in our mind or heart and, and uh, maybe would post a scripture on our fridge in the kitchen and so on. And uh, I recall times where she's done that in terms of this uh, topic, uh, t contentment that is. And it is important that we um, submerge ourselves in God's Word, that we uh, kind of immerse ourselves in it so that it's not just something that we frequent on occasion when we perhaps hear the preacher preach or when we're at Bible study, but instead that every day we're wanting to, uh, we're wanting to be saturated with God's Word and wanting its principles, that is the principles of the Kingdom of God, to become uh, just a, a part of, of our fiber and being, so to speak, where it's, um, it, it's our default position to automatically go to God's Word and seek our counsel there and to be instantly uh, stirred in terms of perhaps some present at hand circumstance and immediately a verse of Scripture comes to our mind that gives us a sense of context for that particular situation. What a wonderful way to live out our lives in terms of appreciating God's Word and letting it impact our hearts. But just tonight I want to take a few minutes to talk about considering some truths that have to do with uh, giving and have to do with honoring God uh, through what we do give to His kingdom. Uh, I want you con to consider these truths, if you would, tonight. First of all, number one, our giving should be seen as a heavenly investment. I am talking about monetary given, giving now for just a bit, although we could expand this to include our, uh, our giving of our time and so on as well. But uh, I want to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, and we're going to read there beginning at verse number 11 and go down to verse number 15. And in chapter number 3 and verse number 11, it says, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Uh, the Word of God uh, seems to underline for us that what we do as unto the Lord all of what is a context of 
how our life has played out is being taken note of and God is going to bring us to a time where our works will be judged. Um, we're not talking about the great white throne judgment now, but we are talking about the judgment seat of Christ. And we are talking about that fateful day when the Lord will review what we have done in the context of being his child and uh, in the context of rewarding uh, us for our efforts in God's kingdom and then to uh, and then to also taking note of perhaps uh, our potential of having done better the scripture text that we read in opening tonight was of course from the words of Jesus in the sermon on the mount where he says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt. And he goes on to say, you know, put your, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. It seems obvious that he's wanting to underline the fact that what we do down here is uniquely important in terms of the eternal realm. And rather than being without consequence, that is what we do down here, it is uniquely important and uh, so this is why we, uh, we are spurred on and uh, encouraged in the kingdom of God to invest wisely with our life, to do what God would bid us do for his kingdom and, and have hope and uh, knowledge that what we do for him is not without reward. Someday every small deed, every great deed will be taken note of and and along with that, in terms of what might be practical and lived out in our life, in terms of being good to those around us and, and uh, taking uh, care to uh, see that we operate as God's hands and his feet and we see needs through our eyes that need to be taken care of. Uh, I think, too, we also need to acknowledge that our, our giving, our our stewardship in terms of finances is also important and that God will uh, inevitably take note of, of what we have done with what, how we have been blessed. Surely we could certainly appreciate that we in North America or in uh, our Western culture have been uniquely blessed uh, materially and uh, compared to so many other uh, points or parts of the world we have so much to be thankful for and I know that you share that sentiment but in so doing or acknowledging we should also be mindful that just like we have been afforded much in terms of blessing we have a responsibility with regards to that blessing and um, uh, we we cannot simply shrug our shoulders and and be of the mindset that uh, God doesn't care or God isn't mindful of how we uh, operate in terms of how that we have been blessed or what we do with the money that uh, God blesses us with. And, and uh, we thank the Lord for his blessings, but we should be mindful that there is a, a day coming when we will, uh, we will respond uh, to God in terms of how well we have been doing as stewards of the blessings that he has put in our life. And I know that we all want to someday stand before him and hear him say, well done thou good and faithful servant. Secondly, we should also note that we give in faith that God will meet our needs. It may be that sometimes God would press us uh, to give of a nature that challenges us in terms of uh, our thinking well if I, if I give you if I give everything that's in my wallet then what am I going to do about the rest of the week or how is this going to get taken care of and but we give in faith believing as children of God that uh, God does take care of his own and that God secondly uh, responds to faith and he in the context of our monetary giving, I think that we uh, would have uh, testimonies of a great number within our congregation of people who have tried God in this regard and, and found that he has been faithful and good, abundantly so in, in terms. And I've heard your testimonies at times 
where you've talked about the goodness of God and the faithfulness of God and maybe gave and didn't know where some other uh, some other funds were going to come from in terms of just having now given something to the kingdom of God and, and God supplied the need. Uh, it's appropriate and right that we utilize faith in terms of our giving. And we noted in a, a lesson, I believe it was a couple of weeks ago, about uh, that Sermon on the Mount again that we've referenced, referenced again and again in terms of Jesus talking about uh, how that he takes note of the fowls of the air. And uh, he also talked about the lilies of the field and, and so on. And uh, those inferences or those references, I should say, are not lost on us in that we understand that God was uh, revealing to mankind that if we would take the principles of his kingdom and insert them in our heart and live by them, that God will see that we're taken care of. Thank God for that. And then thirdly, I would want to point out that uh, giving should make us happy in terms of giving to God's kingdom. Uh, it would be a, uh, a sorrowful or a sad thing if what God receives from us is only that which we give from a begrudging heart. Uh, that's not the context of how the kingdom of God is going or should be about. Uh, uh, we uh, understand that the scripture tells us that God loves a cheerful giver that something about giving to the kingdom of God should inspire us, should enthuse us, uh, should, uh, should, in terms of where we draw our satisfaction from, uh, make us very happy and, and uh, elated in terms of being help, being able to help the kingdom of God and to uh, do so with a heart that is fixed upon wanting to honor God and do his bidding. Uh, that reference in terms of uh, cheerful giver it comes to us in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse number uh, 7. Uh, we shouldn't give grudgingly or a out of a sense of necessity. Uh, we must keep a proper perspective in terms of approaching God with our offerings, what it is that we have to give to him. And I, I guess this part wouldn't necessarily only uh, have to do with our monetary giving, uh, also with the time or talents that God has bestowed us with. We should also give of them readily and of a, a heart that is filled with uh, cheer and happiness because of being able to contribute to God's kingdom. God took issue with Israel at various times in their history because they came to different points in their sojourn walking with the Lord where the offerings that they brought to God were, um, I was going to say, secondary in, in terms of quality. You know, they they brought the lamb that perhaps uh, was not without blemish. Uh, they brought the, the goat that um, maybe, you know, wasn't without spot or uh, was had some imperfection. That's what I'm wanting to say. Maybe uh, a, a broken leg or something of that nature. Uh, it, it, it just got to that point where instead of it being the best, that they were offering God, uh, still wanting to fulfill their obligation, think of this now, still wanting to fulfill their obligation, they felt uh, it, uh, I'm not sure if appropriate is the right word, but they felt it would be uh, uh, somewhat, um, uh, so somewhat looked over if they just brought something out of obligation and uh, not necessarily their best or not necessarily given with a cheerful heart. And God took issue with that at different times in their, in their uh, history and upbraided them in terms of them not uh, following through with what really should have been their intent to honor God first and give him the very best and to, to do that 
of a willful heart, etc. And so I think it's important that as children of God, in taking a lesson from that period of time and transposing it to New Testament Christianity, it's important that we always be mindful of what heart or what attitude we have in terms of coming to God with our offering, whether it be monetary or otherwise. Praise God. Certainly it is uh, important that we pray and ask God to keep our heart clear of debris and clear of any sentiment that would be a roadblock to us in terms of uh, our willingly and enthusiastically wanting to be our very best for God. I hope that this season that we have passed through has put something in our hearts that wants us to be the best that we can be for God. When everything else has been uh, so unique about this time, and maybe we have been stretched in ways that we never imagined would be uh, brought into the picture, I hope that God is still in sharp focus in our life and that we see him as being incredibly important as to how we play out these next several weeks, months, maybe years, if we have years prior to the Lord's return. And I think we're all aware that we have some sense about us that Jesus is returning soon and that the signs of his return are all around. And we need to be mindful of being our very best for the Lord Jesus Christ. Before I conclude, I want to take some time to talk about the issue of tithing particularly. It's that issue that perhaps of, a, of its nature, comes to the fore when one's talking about stewardship. And uh, there are perhaps questions that arise in terms of, of Christianity and what part it should play and, and how, how relevant it should remain in terms of our own living out our lives for Jesus Christ <clears throat> uh, and why we still see it as God's intentional plan of sustaining the church and so on. I want to just touch for a moment upon a few important parts of how tithing came to be and, and uh, how we should feel about this. First of all, tithing began with a Gentile. I say that because sometimes there are those who suggest that tithing was only um, extended to the Israelite nation of course, a part of the law and so on. But tithing began with uh, a man by the name of, of Abraham. It was not in, invented for, I'm going to say, the Israelites. And I mean that in the national context. Abraham paid tithes. Uh, Jacob continues in terms of Abraham's grandson continues the biblical narrative regarding tithing. And uh, of course, when Abraham and, and Jacob paid tithes, uh, Israel was not a nation at that point. Uh, and the law that would later come through Moses had not uh, been delivered uh, to the nation of Israel. That would come some uh, 400 plus years later after their time in Egypt, etc. And so that in itself brings us to reflect upon the beginning of how the Bible describes this practice uh, and, of course, discounts any suggestion that it was something that only the Israelites were expected to do or was extended to them particularly as a nation. It was a part of Abraham's life and, uh, and as we also mentioned, his his family's life. Uh, uh, secondly, the, the early church actually did more than simply tithe. In that critical period where so much is changing with regards to the Spirit of God having been outpoured on the day of Pentecost and revival having been initiated and uh, great things happening in the city of Jerusalem, Acts chapter number 2 along with it giving us those profound words from the Apostle Peter when he gives us uh, his response in terms of the question, what will we do 
uh, to the, uh, that has been asked by those who have been listening to him preach, we can quote Acts 2.38 and understandably so, and probably 39 as well. But later in that chapter, we come to learn that those early Christians in taking um, in, in taking a remarkable step and in probably anticipating that what had just happened was so profound and the church was, uh, was at this critical point of its initiation, the Bible tells us that they brought their possessions and goods and um, they, they uh, give them to the apostles and... Uh, it was remarkable. Uh, <clears throat> you know, we, we sometimes have talked about how that Jesus raised the bar in, in terms of what he did in, uh, in speaking about topics such as um, adultery and uh, then also about uh, murder. Uh, he, he raised the bar in that he, he commented and said, if if you look at a woman with lust in your heart uh, and uh, you've committed adultery and, and then he went on to say that if you hate your brother, my, he, he um, profoundly challenged people in terms of their thinking. And here we have another scenario where it, it seems almost that uh, these early Christians are responding in some context of appreciating that uh, the bar has been raised. It's not just about responding to uh, God's kingdom in terms of giving a tenth of their income, but they, they're wanting to do even more. It seems these early Christians were ready to excel in terms of giving, a giving that surpassed the requirements of the law. Now, I'm, I'm here tonight to advocate in terms of uh, being a proponent of tithing because I believe God will, will bless those that honor him. And, uh, but I, I bring that to your attention because it's important, I believe, to recognize how enthused and, and uh, how dedicated they were to this new entity, the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, thirdly, while some would say the New Testament is relatively silent regarding the topic of tithes, we must consider the context of that silence. You've got an early church that was comprised primarily of Jews, and uh, we, while we do see that early church coming to terms with issues like circumcision, uh, feast, festivals that were part of the Jewish calendar, it seems evident that some practices continued uh, despite this huge transition that was taking care, taking a part uh, in their lives from Judaism to Christianity. And it seems as the Word of God sees us um, or informs us in, in this playing out that tithing is one of those elements that uh, made the transition, if you please, from that time of Jesus ministry into that New Testament era. I close tonight by turning to Math Malachi, pardon me, Malachi chapter number three and reading a probably familiar passage of scripture that talks about that or this particular topic. It's one you probably have heard reference before in terms of a, an Old Testament prescribed uh, situation where God is questioning Israel and he is bringing them to task. But he also in the middle of bringing them to task because of their failures, he includes a unique promise. And I will begin to read at verse number seven. And he, uh, he writes there, the prophet does, even from the days of your fathers, ye are gone away from mine ordinances and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye said, Wherein shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? 
end of question right there. And uh, he continues in tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. What an indictment that God brings against the nation of Israel. But then he goes on in verse number 10. Thank God he goes on. He says, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Praise God. He goes on, I wasn't going to continue to verse number 11, but maybe I will. He goes on by saying, And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. That's quite a profound promise that God extends to this nation who had been wayward and forgetful in terms of their responsibilities before God as stewards. And while, as I read this evening, obviously God um, was not pleased with what had taken place, isn't it just like God to insert a promise into the midst of what is a context of judgment and condemnation? Isn't it just like God to insert a promise, praise God, in the middle of what he would be taking them to task for? That's just like my God. And I'm glad tonight that we can give ourselves to his kingdom in the sure sense of confidence that our giving to God and yes, our, our stewardship and our commitment in terms of honoring his kingdom through our tithes and offerings uh, is, not, is not played out in our lives without God taking note of our faithfulness without God taking note of our being intentional and deliberate. Praise God. I hope that we do it with a, a heart that is filled with praise and thanksgiving to God. Not begrudgingly and not unwillingly out of obligation, but filled with sentiment in terms of enthusiasm because of what God has done and how blessed we already are in knowing him and having his touch upon our life. Praise God. Thank you so much tonight. They're going to sing another song for us, and we look forward to seeing you Sunday. And uh, we're going to come back to the house of the Lord, anticipating good things and uh, excited about being in his presence. God bless you this evening. Praise God. <music>